Uh, Luke, you're a cosmologist and have really focused and uh, brought a lot of people's attention to the concept of, uh, of fine tuning. So let's, um, I'd, I'd love to find out in depth what are the key fine tuning numbers in cosmology? What's the total um, universe, uh, so to speak, of, of the, the key numbers and why they are the key numbers? And then pick a few of them. And, and I'd like to understand the tolerance limits when we talk about fine tuning. What does that mean? So the key sort of standard model of cosmology we have has about six numbers in it that, that describe how the universe starts off and how it expands and then the, the basics of this, how structure forms in the universe. Well, the, really how the structure started off in the universe. So the most famous uh, one of these is known as the cosmological constant, which we discovered in, in, in 1998 uh, was making the expansion of the universe accelerate. That's a very famous example of fine tuning just because uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that we have a good handle on how big it could have been. Uh, there's a sort of standard calculation in particle physics that says it could be as large as something called the Planck scale. So we have a, a, a range of values it could have in our theories. But when we look at what would happen if it were different to what it is, you get disastrously rapid acceleration or deceleration. So around say zero where nothing much happens there's a small range that we're in where you can have structure form but out to if you have a large cosmological constant uh, the universe expands so fast that the the standard way that galaxies form by just anything that has mass grabs other mass and brings it in that fails because everything sort of moves away too fast that's a very sort of convincing and straightforward way to make a universe with no structure no complexity and no life is if no, nothing complex forms at all. And if it was negative, uh, negative, negative pressure, then we, we maybe we'd go in the opposite direction and you'd have, instead of complex structures being formed, you'd have everything clumped together. Well, actually the entire universe recollapses. Yeah. So you, yes, you would for a short time get structure forming more quickly, <laughs> but it would all be headed towards a big crunch. And so, if no time for life to evolve. No so. time for life to evolve is the short story. It, it, it heads to zero and, and okay. uh, everything. All right, so, so let's get back to that. I just want to get the, 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 to the, the, the total picture. So the cosmological constant is one. I understand that. Yep. What are some others? Well, one of the other important ones is the level of lumpiness in the early universe, this parameter called Q. Uh, it's when we look back to the cosmic microwave background, the lumps and bumps in that, the, you know, this bit's more dense than that bit by one part in 100,000, so it's all very smooth. That sets the seeds for uh, <coughs> cosmic growth, for galaxies to form, for all of that over the next, you know, We get that couple. from the cosmic microwave background? Yeah, we, 100, we see that number there. Yeah. That's how we measure it. Uh, but we can again play the game, what if that were different? If it were <laughs> too small, you don't have the seeds there and the universe just stays smooth for mm -hmm. most of its history and nothing forms, same sort of problem. If it's too everything large, is homogenous, <coughs> yeah. yeah, everything just stays homogeneous and that's, that's the end of that story. There you, every proton is just sort of isolated in empty yeah. space, so, so not much interesting happens there. If it's too large, things are a little bit fuzzy. It seems like you might make galaxies that are a bit too dense. So you don't have a solar, you wouldn't have solar systems that sort of stay like ours is just is left alone for four and a half billion years to make planets and all that things other stars would start wandering through which is bad news for for planets but if you had you know a big enough universe there'd be outskirts of some galaxies where that wouldn't be such a problem so it's hard to know where to draw a line there but certainly if you make you larger still instead of making galaxies via this slow sort of clumping in process where you make stars and all that you would instead make black holes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it seems like there are problems if Q is too large as well. Okay, what is Q? We, we, we know, or we think we know, the cosmological constant is this, is this um, actual pressure in, yeah. in empty space because of quantum physics and all of that. Uh, but what is Q other than a number that you calculate as, a, as an empirical number? Is it related to anything? It simply describes how large the variations are away from average density in the early universe. Okay, but, so, but, but that's generated by something else. Yeah. In, Whether it's quantum yeah. fluctuation or something, it's generating that. Well, that, 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 that depends on the story you tell, how you think the universe um, evolved before the, the sort of 
first stages where uh, the okay. cosmological model. So okay. yeah, if if you think inflation is that story, it should tell you what Q is. Okay. So All then right. that number wouldn't be fundamental. It would go back to some other set of numbers. Right. Right. But it's a, it's an empirical number at some point which describes the universe, which is critical, which is a critical yes. fine tuning. It's generated by some whatever happened before. If it's inflation. Or yeah. Something. Okay. Got that. Uh, so it's two. What, what are a couple others? Another one is uh, how much dark matter and baryonic matter there are, or sort of ordinary matter there is in the universe. And again, you have to sort of be in a, 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 an interesting range there. Dark matter actually does help structure in our universe. Ordinary matter has pressure, so the pressure you see in a balloon. So as the universe tries to make it collapse, it's, the gravity tries to make it collapse, it will fight back against gravity. Uh, but because dark matter doesn't have that, it can collapse earlier, so it helps structure in our universe. But dark matter won't, so far as we know, interact with itself very weakly, so probably won't make any interesting structures, won't make life, yeah. Right, right. So you need baryonic matter there as well. Okay. So you, you, if you had a purely baryonic universe, it seems like you wouldn't have as many galaxies, but a purely dark matter universe wouldn't make interesting structure, because the dark matter doesn't seem to be able to do that. and so. It, we're in a sort of interesting range there in the middle. Okay, okay. All right, um, any others of interest, uh, like um, uh, the mass density of the universe I've heard about? Uh, those, so it's in the earlier stages of the universe, there's a relationship between the rate at which the universe expands and how dense it is. And so we're on this fine line that's called you know, flatness for various yeah, right, reasons. Right. Uh, if, if that was slightly different, we'd have the same sorts of problems with the cosmological constant. The, the universe would either recollapse too quickly under its own gravity, or it would expand so fast that no structure forms. So basically what I hear is that there are a number of different characteristics that um, all lead to the same kind of fine-tuning result. Either the, uni the universe has to be on this fine line, or we don't, we're not sure of the width of the line, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a line. Uh, some people think it's wider than others, uh, that it, uh, either um, it, on, on one hand the, the universe could expand too fast so that, that no structures would be formed, on the other hand it would, it would uh, form structures too, too quickly and then recollapse them among each other and it has to be in the middle where, where we are now and that various of these constants can, can lead to that. So here, here's the question, pick, pick a constant, you know, baryonic matter to dark matter and, and you say there's a fine-tuning. What does fine-tuning mean? Is it, is it a factor of two? Or is it a factor of you know, 10 to the 20th difference? Or is it a factor of 0.001%? Everybody talks about fine-tuning, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know what the, you know, the parameters are. What, what, what's relative? Maybe fine-tuning to you is not fine-tuning to me. Yeah, so one of the things that you need to sort of to set up the problem is an understanding of what's the set of possibilities that this theory opens up. So theories sort of live in their own world, right? They, if you're doing cosmology, you're supposed to be modeling the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, like yeah. the whole lot. So the numbers in this theory are sort of part of that, that world that your theory creates. And so there's a set of possibilities that the theory determines. So perhaps the simplest example is the cosmological constant, where the theory we have quite sort of we have quite specific bounds on what that number could be within the theory itself. Mm -hmm. uh, those are related to uh, if if it's too large, then we would actually need a quantum theory of gravity to know what's going on. We don't really have one of those, so we can draw a, f a, a line in the sand. Here's where this number could be. We, within that, the standard sort of uh, way of calculating that number tells us that the life permitting range is something like one part in 10 to the power of 120. Now there are, there are ways that that might be mitigated by you know, even 50, 60 orders of magnitude, but you're still, <laughs> you're still left with you know, 10 to the 50, 10 to the 60. Yeah, well, that's an incredible one, and that, that's, that, that's a, in a sense an outlier. It's one everybody talks about. Yeah. Pick, pick one of the others, either Q or the ratio <coughs> of, uh, of ordinary matter to dark matter. Right. Uh, I mean, that, that's a number that's easy to... The ratio of or, or, ordinary matter to dark matter is roughly, what, 4 over 29 or 30 or something like uh, that? Yeah, percentage. something like that, yeah. So, um, what's fine-tuned there? Is it 1%? Is it double? Or how do you define fine-tuning? Well, if you think of it as a ratio, it looks like in an order of magnitude either way, it will be all right for life, as long as you've got some dark matter to help you great structure and you've still got ordinary matter to fall in and make galaxies, it seems like you're okay. So you're talking about a factor of 10. 
So well, if, 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 if that's an order of magnitude. So if, if, if ordinary matter was is now uh, four over over uh, twenty nine, if ordinary matter was uh, forty over right. uh, forty over sixty five or something, yeah. uh, that, would, that that's an order of magnitude and. And that's still fine-tuned because in physics you can have orders of magnitude of not just one order of magnitude, yeah. but of 40 or something. Yeah. yeah, and especially if the physics that sets these numbers is totally different. If, if I say, you know, pick a number t between one, a, and one and a, a, a trillion and pick another number between yeah. one and a trillion, yeah. if you end up with numbers of the same order of magnitude, that's kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's not a totally clear-cut case, but there's still a ca uh, an interesting thing perhaps there to be explained. Why are these numbers close to each other? 